Father, we come to this moment where we listen to you speak. And it's a very important moment, Lord. Even if we are to stop and to think that we are gathered because we want to hear God's voice. Not the voice of man or a person, but the voice of God. Because it is your voice and your words that changes us. It gives us hope. It strengthens us. It helps us see, Lord, our weaknesses. It points the truth as to where we have been stumbling and sets us, Lord, on the right course. Lord, this is such a moment as that. And it is, it is important. It's very significant. And so, Lord, this morning as we talk and enter into this season where we are trying to prepare our hearts to understand the meaning of the cross and how it impacts our lives, we pray, Father, that may you come by your Spirit. Come, Lord, and speak to each person that's here. Touch them where you know where they need to be touched. And, Lord, we look to you. We look to you that even when you show us our weakness, that those weakness will be showered with grace and mercy. For you are good. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, if you have been following the announcement, we are beginning a new series called The Things He Carried. And it's in reference to what Christ carried as he was carrying his cross, right? And following, and after that, the crucifixion. There are things that he carried. Right? This morning we'll talk about he carried the cross. Right? Next week we know that he had a crown of thorns. And he also had a seamless cloth that was wrapped around. He also carried God's hope and salvation for humanity. He also carried the disappointment that he had of his disciples, that they abandoned him. So these are some of, the, some of the topics that we will cover in the weeks to come. But the idea is that we're trying to help the church help us prepare our hearts as Easter comes up. Right? Sometimes we just continue regularly in life, and all of a sudden Easter is here, and as a church we had a nice meal, and we go home, and we forgot what it's all about. There was a girl that was visiting in England with his family, visiting cathedrals, right? So in England, you have these Gothic cathedrals. And they were looking at one, and she looked at her dad and said, that's horrible, that's horrible. Right? It was a nice cathedral, right? It, they had the steeples that pointed to the sky, and it was you know, well built, and, you know, but she said it was horrible. And the dad looked at her and said, why? Why is it horrible? And he said, look at it. It's in the form of a, st of a cross. Right? The cathedral was actually built like a cross. And she thought that it was horrible. The significance of the cross and its meaning, I think in today's culture, has lost that significance. Right? We have seen, or I have seen at least, right, in the last decades, that the cross has become more like a fashion statement. Right? Everybody wears a big cross, it has either to be silver or gold, and with a fancy chain. I think that should be a new dress code for pastors. <laughs> right? Cross, big chain, it look cool. <laughs> right? It has lost the essence of its meaning. Right? The cross is so significant, my friends. When you look from there and you just see what he carried, on the cross, he carried our sins. On the cross, he carried the disappointment. He carried sickness and shame and guilt. All that was upon him. But this morning, I want to explore something different. That that is the cross of Christ comes with another... Sorry, there's a second thing that I just want to talk about. Uh, this song, right? We, this is a song that we often sing at Christmas, right? It's joy to the world, right? You guys know that? Joy to the world. Like Lance would be leading next week. I will be now if I keep singing. <laughs> then it says, No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. Right? He comes to make his blessings flow. Then it says this, For as the curse is found. For as the curse is found. 
Have you ever thought about that? When we sing this song, why the word curse is there? Right? It says joy to the world. Right? There should be joy. There should be happiness. There should be peace. Right? There should be blessings that flow. Then it has this, like, it, it's, it's almost disturbing. For us, the curse is found. For us, the curse is found. Right? How would you define curse? Let me, let me throw it to you, right? If I say you were to curse me, I bet you're going to say all nice things about me. Hey, Paul, your hair looks good. <laughs> you are just a fantastic pastor, Paul. I love your preaching, Paul. Right? Like, like you build me up, then you put me down. Right? That's, that's what it is. <laughs> right? When you talk about a curse, right? A curse is not something nice. When I grew up, I was taught not to curse. If I get cursed, I have hot peppers in my mouth. My mother, my mother was terrible with that. <laughs> right? What is a curse? Right? Curse is not nice. Curse, right? It's like for us, it may mean witches saying something to ask somebody. Right? That's kind of the idea that we have. Right? Harry Potter. Right? You curse people. Or maybe you speak badly about people. But what does the Bible say when it talks about curse? Right? In this text, I want to explore with us in Genesis, sorry, Deuteronomy 1, right? This one here, Deuteronomy 21. Right? Look at it. If somebody, if somebody, if someone is guilty of a capital offense, right? What is a capital offense? Right? Yeah. An offense that is punishable by death. Right? That's what a capital offense is. Right? And he's put to death. Their body is exposed on a pole, or some translation said on a tree. You must not leave the body hanging in the pole or the tree overnight. Be sure to bury it the same day because anyone who's hung on a pole is under God's curse. Right? You must not desecrate the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. So this is from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is Moses instructing people, reminding them of the way they are to live and behave and conduct themselves as the people of God. Right? And sometimes you come across where people commit a capital offense. When the person commits a capital offense, the Bible is saying, and, and their body is exposed, right? Maybe on a tree or something. It says, don't leave the body hanging overnight. Right? Don't further, in, don't further, not malign. Um, bring in indignity to the person. Because if you leave the body overnight, the birds can come, right, pick it apart, right, and you just leave it there. That, the, the, God is saying to them, don't do that. Create respect, honor. Bring the body, bury it. Right? And it says, right, in this one here, uh, because anyone who is hung on the pole is under God's curse. Right? Right? And in in, uh, in Galatians 3, 13 to 14, bear with me, right? Paul uses the same thing. Paul uses the same thing, right? He said, for it is written, curse is everyone who is hung on a pole or on a tree, right? He's referring to Jesus, right? Curse is anyone who is hung on a pole. And he says, he redeem us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ, through Christ, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Right? Curse is everyone who is hung on the tree. So when we talk about the cross, right? When you talk about the cross, from that text, right, Paul is saying that curse is Jesus who hung on the tree, right? And the cross, right? Most of us never think about that, right? We don't think about Jesus. We know that Jesus died on the cross. We don't think about Jesus as being cursed. We don't think about that, right? And when we think about a person that when we go back to Genesis chapter 3, right? When you go back to Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and have sinned, God came and God judged them. And in, in Genesis chapter 3, it talks about how God cursed the snake and how God cursed the land, right? 
curse is not just us talking. Right? In the Bible, when somebody is cursed, the curse, the, the word curse, comes from the idea that people have disobeyed God. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They rebelled against Him. They disobeyed Him. They made a choice. Right? So when we rebel and disobey God, the consequences of that is what in the Bible is called cursed. We are cursed because of that. Right? There is separation from God. Right? Life, life becomes diminished. The woman, it says in Genesis, that they will suffer during time of pregnancy and giving birth. The man would have to toil, work hard from the sweat of his brows, he will feed himself. The earth will grow thistles and thorns. It's no longer paradise, my friends. And that is part of the curse. Right? So when we think about curse biblically, it stems from the fact that we have done something in rebellion as a result of sin against God. Then the consequences of that is the curse. Right? So that is very important. That is very important. So when we look at our text today, in the text that we've been thinking about in number two, the cross and the curse, right? For it is written, right, curse is everyone who hung on the pole. He redeemed us, right, and uh, redeemed us in order that blessings given to Abraham might come through the Gentiles, through Christ, so that by faith we might receive the promise, the hope, the reassurance of us being forgiven. But in the, in the, in the New Testament, when you read the New Testament and Christ's suffering, there are two ways, right? When you are hung on the pole and crucified, like Jesus was not the only one that was crucified, my friends. Right? There are probably tens of thousands of Jews that were crucified during Jesus' time. Right? In one of the, one of the historical books that I read, they said about 300,000. Another one about 60, 70,000. So I don't know which one. But I think it's fair to say there were a lot of people that were crucified during Jesus' time. But the one that was most memorable and is remembered often is the death of Jesus Christ, right? So the cross, as we've now talked about, is not a wonderful thing, right? It's a horrible tool for execution. It's disgusting, right? It's terrible. That's what the cross is about. But if a person is crucified in Jesus' time, there are two things that happen, right? That they are cursed. They are cursed in two ways, right? The first one, they are cursed by secular authority, right? When we read in Luke or in Mark 15, it talks about when, when, when the religious leaders, right? The Romans, they, they, wanted, they wanted Jesus to be crucified. And it says that the, the religious leaders gave Jesus over to the Romans. What did the Romans do, Right? The Romans beat him. They beat him up. They beat his head. Right? They stripped him. Right? Then they scourged him. They had this whip that they whipped him with. And then they put a purple cloth on him. And they begin to, to, to mock him, practicing that they were worship, as if they were worshipping. Right? They were worshipping the king. They spat on him. Then they gave him the cross to carry. And finally, they crucified him. That was done, my friends, by secular authorities. The Romans did that. Right? In my reading, sometimes the people said that even just from whipping and the scourging, sometimes the injuries that sustained, most people didn't even make it to the cross. It was so bad, it rips people's back and sometimes into the organs. Just, just, yeah. So you see, the curse is tied to the awfulness of what's been done to Jesus. Now, let, let, me, let me make an application. Right? How does this affect you? Like, if Jesus was cursed by secular authorities, what big deal? That happened to him, not to us. Let me tie it, right? To us. Sometimes in our lives, we also feel cursed by authorities and by our culture. Sometimes if you are a minority, you are told that you are not good enough. You don't look like the rest of us, you don't fit. Maybe you struggle with some oddities. 
and you don't feel you belong. The culture, the authorities, the secular culture tells you that you don't belong. Maybe there are things that you have that the world looks at it and say, nah, you don't make the standard, you don't make the cut. And you feel marginalized, you feel pushed aside because the powers and the authority tells you what you look like and what you should be. And that goes for all of us, my friends. And you see the good news about this? Is that Jesus understands that. He understands and he knows exactly what you have gone through. You're not experiencing it alone. Jesus has experienced that through the cross. He was cursed by the secular authorities. They pushed him to the margin. They made a mockery of him. They made fun of him. They shamed him. They stripped him. They beat on him. They put the crown of thorns on him. And they took like something like a bat and just beat on him. My friends, sometimes life and the culture and the authorities around us may paint a picture to you and to me and tell you you do not belong. And you feel alone. You feel rejected. You feel like, man, I, life is not worth living. Let me remind you, today you can have hope that Jesus was cursed in the same way. He understands what you're going through. So don't give up hope. Don't give up hope. You can call on his name. You can say to him, Jesus, you know how it feels. People may have sworn at you. People may have put you down. People may you know, feel like you've rejected because some things that have happened in the past. Whether socially, politically, or in some ways. Just to remind you that God knows what you're going through. And secondly, the second point that I want, people are cursed by religious authority. Right? When we read the first Acts, it says if somebody has committed a capital offense, right? Capital offense is like blasphemy. If you speak against God, or you commit adultery, right? Or you commit incest. There are the strings of things that when you commit and you sin, that is, cap that is punishable by death, right? The religious authority will put you and nail you to the cross because of you if you sin, right? On the cross, my friends, Jesus was nailed on the cross. The text that we have read in, in Galatians 3, 13 to 14, it says, Cursed is the one who hung on that pole, right? He redeemed us, right? Cursed is the one who died on that pole. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us, right? It's not only you. It does not negate we as leaders in the church are holier than you, right? It's not the Jews that they thought, oh, we are free from that because we have faith in Abraham. No, the Bible says, for all have sinned. There's no discrimination with sin, my friends. And because of sin, Jesus took our sin on the cross. He became a curse for you and for me. Right? You, you're getting the picture? Because of my sin, because of the curse of my disobedience, he who knew no sin became sin for you and for me. Right? He carried not only the cross, my brothers and sisters, he carried the curse that was upon us. He paid the price. He died. And when he was on the cross, he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why, my friends? Why? It was a cry, the, the old church father says, it was the cry that made them tremble. Because on the cross, God was isolated. Jesus was isolated. Sin had separated him from the Father. He took upon your sin and my sin, my friends, so that you and I can have life. Right? Think about that. I don't like to walk around thinking that I'm cursed. I don't like to walk around thinking my family is cursed. Right? It, it, it takes a different spin on the meaning of sin. 
But you see, my friends, that's what Jesus did on that cross. God took our sin, your sin and my sin, the curse that comes with it, and nailed it to him. He paid the price. For God so loved the world that he sent his only one and go- son, beloved son, right? To die on the cross so that you and I might have life. Right? When he died and he rose again, he made us right with him. The power and the curse that was upon him was broken. It collapsed. Right? So when we come to see the cross, right? when we come to see the cross, we need to remember that. Right? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Look, look at that. Look at the, f- the following part. What did it say? Right? By becoming what? Can we read it? By becoming a curse for who? For us. That's what the Bible says. I'm not saying that. Jesus became a curse for you, my brothers and sisters. Does that register in you? That Jesus became a curse for you. Right? He was not cursed because he sinned. He was sinless. He was perfect. He was without sin, now he became sin because my sin put him on the cross. Your sin put him on the cross. He was perfect. He was cursed because of you and me. Right? What then shall we conclude? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. Right? For we have already made the charge Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of sin. My friends, sin is not lying, just like lying or lusting or greedy. No. Sin, as Paul describes it, it's a power. It's something that has a hold on us that when we try to do what is good, we can't. The very thing that we don't want to do, we keep doing it. Right? That's the power of sin. But in Christ's death and resurrection, that power was broken. The curse was broken. We have now become new people in Jesus Christ. So this Easter, this Easter as we move on, maybe this week, would you think about that? Just think about curse. Think about it. How has curse impacted my life? How has curse influenced me? How do I see that? When Jesus said, take up your cross, and follow me. What does that mean to you? Are you willing to live and walk like Jesus, selflessly giving of yourself in helping others come to find blessings, right, instead of walking in disobedience? Maybe in your own personal life, right, you have been redeemed, you have found Christ, and yet sometimes it's just good to go back Maybe this week, this next few weeks, as we go through this, maybe the time you can pray and ask God, God, show me my weaknesses and my sins so I may confess it. That I may walk in a way, right? Walk in a way that's a blessing to others. You see, that's what the opposite of curse is blessing. That's the opposite, right? Fullness of life, thriving, enjoying life. That's blessings. Fruitfulness. Right? Enjoying family and all that. That's part of God's blessing. Right? But it's very important, my friends. Right? Romans 3, 22. Right? This righteousness is given. Right? What, is, what does righteousness mean? Righteousness means that God has rectified, God has made right. Right? The curse, the sin, God has made right by us putting our faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Right? Just like all who have sinned, when we come to believe Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter whether you are Jew or Gentile, black or white or yellow or red. When we believe in Jesus, God forgives us. And there is no difference, it says. Right? God does not discriminate. It doesn't matter, my friends, whether you feel like you've sinned so horribly or maybe you feel like you've sinned so well or maybe better. Right? It doesn't matter to God. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The Bible says God makes us all rectified all our issues on the cross of Jesus Christ. He makes us right. 
so that we are acceptable to him. And the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But it is only through Jesus Christ that we are also made righteous, that he rectifies, he set the record, or so he set the wrong right by his death and resurrection. And maybe you're here this morning and you feel and have felt all along that the curse of God or whatever because of consequences of your sin is upon you. And it's been very hard for you to let go of it. You try to do good. You try to live by a set of rules. Maybe you draw a straight line and said, that's how I'm going to be. But you realize that you cannot keep that straight line because there's a lot of things that's happening. And maybe this morning you can say, Jesus, I come to you. I recognize my weaknesses. I recognize the sin that has its power over me and I cannot break it. I'm so thankful that today I come to understand that you became cursed for me so that I might have life. I ask you to come, come into my life, come into my heart and transform me. I give my heart and my soul to you. They are yours. Do a new thing in me so that I can be a blessing to my community and to others around me. Maybe that's a good prayer, my friends. Maybe as we go through this time, may we think about it. This week, please think. Think about the cross and the curse and the power of God to redeem us from that curse and set us free and make us his children, his people, the one he loves, right? And give us a promise, not only for today, but the days to come. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, the cross is so fascinating, Lord. Maybe fascinating is not a good word to describe it. It's so multidimensional. Every time we look at it, there's new things that we can learn from it. There's also new things, Lord, that teach us about ourselves. Lord, we of all people, individually, we don't want to be called that we are cursed. It's horrible. It's unthinkable. But yet today, Lord, you've taught us that on that cross, you took on the curse that is ours. You who knew no sin, he who is sinless, became sin for us. Help us, O Lord, to understand that deeply so we can come to you with gratitude, so we can come to you and say honestly, Lord, here I am. I have nothing to offer except this poor life. Take it and use it, Lord, so that I can be a source of blessing to others. Lord, help us as we prepare our hearts towards this Easter. Shape and form us, Lord, that we would long to love you more, that we would yearn to see Christ formed in us in a way that would just transform us, Lord, that reflects you more and more. Father, for those that are here that are carrying burdens, burdens that are feeling like they've cursed because of sins and wrongs that have been done to them, and it's hard for them to let go. May the power of the resurrection of Jesus who conquered death, may you bring healing and restoration to this loved one. Speak to them, Lord, and say to them that they are yours. You are mine. I will cleanse you, I will wash you with the blood of Jesus Christ and set you on a path that is firm, that is filled with love, even through hardship that you will never leave them, nor will you ever forsake them. Lord, for those that are perhaps sitting on the fence, they've been wondering about you. They don't know whether they want to commit or they just want to stay. Today, Lord, we pray. May they come to realize, Lord, that the curse will never live unless they bring it to you. 
Call them, Lord, by their names. Call them. Name them and call them that they might come to you. For you are a gracious, compassionate, kind, and forgiving. Love on them, Lord. May the love of God shower them like a waterfall that will wash them through and through. And may the Spirit bubble in them to take away any fear, any reservation, that they will feel deeply in their, in their hearts that they are loved of God, tremendously loved of God. And for us as a church, Lord, we pray that we will cherish the cross of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, as a permanent feature in our minds and in our hearts. Because of that, Lord, we will be filled with gratitude to tell others of the glory of the cross of Jesus Christ. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' most wonderful name. Amen.